Hi everyone, my name is Emily Roach and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of York. My specialist areas of research are 20th and 21st century American fiction, slam and spoken word poetry, contemporary LGBTQ plus fiction and media, and also an area that I call queering popular culture. And what does queering popular culture actually mean? Well, I'm going to take you through uh, one example today when I think about transformative works, uh, that is fan fiction and fan art produced by fan communities. In terms of my research, it can mean all sorts of things from finding LGBTQ plus representation in film, pop music, television, popular book series, and so on, or it can be about finding queer possibility. And I'm going to, again, be talking about that in due course. So before I start, there's three things uh, that I want to break down, and that is queer coding, queer baiting and queer reading. They are three distinct but interrelated concepts. And I think it's important to understand where we get to with this notion of queering popular culture to have that knowledge as background. So what do I mean then by queer coding? Well, queer coding really traces back to the 1930s and the Motion Picture Association produced a code commonly known as the Hayes Code, which uh, set out some important restrictions uh, which makers of film had to adhere to. So what were those restrictions? Well, one of the first was that the audience's sympathy must never be drawn to the side of wrongdoing. The audience must never sympathise with the characters uh, that were seen to be morally wrong, the characters that were sinful, the characters that committed crime and so on. The other important point that the Hayes Code made is that films should not contain any inference to sexual perversion. And you might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with LGBTQ plus visibility? Well, unfortunately, in the 1930s, quite a lot, because that is precisely where LGBTQ plus uh, visibility would have fallen. So what you get is you get this, uh, this landscape evolving where uh, the audience are not allowed to sympathise with any characters that are deemed to be in any way sinful or morally wrong. And you also have an explicit prohibition on uh, having LGBTQ plus representation in film. Keep in mind how important and influential Hollywood film has been. Keep in mind how much it has impacted on the popular culture that we consume today. And you will start to understand the legacy that the Hayes Code has left behind. And again, I'll talk more about that in due course. So what you start to see is you start to see the creators of these films uh, coding characters as queer. Any explicit representation is impossible. And so what they do is through the way the characters dress, the way they speak, perhaps the props that they carry with them uh, at, at various times, all point towards the character being in some way uh, different to the uh, heterosexual cisgendered characters in the film. And the other way in which uh, characters could be queer coded is through their narrative arc. So as well as these signifiers or these pointers that these characters are perhaps a little different to other characters on screen, they also typically have a narrative arc which suggests that they are in a state of bachelorhood, for example. They are isolated, they are alone, and this goes further. They ultimately meet an unhappy end. So you start to see tropes like bury your gaze and the dead lesbian trope uh, perpetuated through this queer coding practice that goes on as a result of the Hayes Code. 
because this, uh, these coded characters were generally uh, morally wrong, uh, then the audience's sympathy would not be allowed to remain with them. They must ultimately meet a tragic end. Alternatively, these stereotypical figures were used as figures of fun, and this perpetuated the idea that LGBTQ plus people were something to be feared or something to be laughed at. So where do we go to then after queer coding and what legacy does this actually have? Well, although the stereotypes, things like camp and butchness aren't in themselves challenging, um, of course, butch for women who love other women is an important identity with a rich and wonderful history. And likewise, camp has an extremely important place within LGBTQ plus communities. It was the way the stereotypes were used, this idea of figures of fun and villainy that has become so harmful. And even though there are some queer coded characters in some of the films uh, that were made during the Hayes Code era that have since become icons of LGBTQ plus communities, clearly that cannot be the only kind of representation that our communities get on screen. It cannot be wholly negative and it cannot only exist in code. Uh, so queer coding generally uh, was a bad and unhelpful thing. So what then is queer baiting? Well, queer baiting uh, is interrelated to queer coding. So I have a preferred definition of queer baiting where there is an existence of a potential romantic same-sex relationship. So queer baiting, a commonly accepted definition is this idea of a prolonged tease, something that is teased at, uh, without ever becoming meaningful uh, representation on screen. So the idea of two characters, uh, they seem to have a particular romantic charge between them and the writers continuously tease at the fact that something might happen between them and yet it ultimately never does. That is what queer baiting is. Now you sometimes see the word queer baiting as it's become part of popular discourse used in other contexts. So it wouldn't be uncommon to see queer baiting used, for example, in relation to celebrities. You might also see it used in relation to something like film or pop music videos. For me personally, I prefer to use queer baiting solely in relation to fictional narratives. And for me also, it is those long running serialized narratives where queer baiting really becomes pertinent. This idea of this long term prolonged investment as opposed to something like a film which runs for say an hour and a half. Um, people will disagree with me on that, of course. With celebrities, it's not that I uh, don't think that celebrities can be just as guilty as scriptwriters and directors and producers of pandering to LGBTQ plus communities without offering uh, anything meaningful in support of them. It's just that I think that type of action when it comes to real people is less of a queer bait and more of an example of rainbow capitalism. Rainbow capitalism is, of course, when during Pride Month, all these big corporations put rainbows on all of their produce. And the question becomes, well, are they actually using that money from their rainbow branded produce to do anything meaningful that is going to help LGBTQ plus people? Have they uh, put their money where their rainbow flag is? And I think uh, that debate around rainbow capitalism, particularly in the space of pop music, is much more relevant and much more pertinent than queer baiting. And rainbow capitalism and the value of the pink pound and all of those things have been around in marketing or have been a concern in marketing for a very long time. And of course, so too has uh, LGBTQ plus visibility in pop. So I think that is quite, for me, that is quite a different space. Um, so queer reading then finally, what is queer reading? Well, queer reading, uh, queer theory is a critical uh, branch of critical thought that developed in the early 1990s. Prominent queer theorists include Judith Butler and Eve Kosofsky-Sedgwick. And so when you read a text 
clearly you are deconstructing a text and a text can be a book, a film, a piece of television, whatever it is that you want to, uh, you want to read queerly. Um, and you find something that disrupts, subverts uh, the status quo. Uh, something that pushes against those ideas of, for example, binary gender, um, something that is uh, a little queer uh, within, the, within the text itself. So it's not really about finding explicit representation when you're undertaking a queer reading, it's actually about finding queer possibility. And there is much debate about where those sites of queer possibility exist. One very early example from the 1990s to give you an idea of what I'm talking about is the idea of the classic love triangle. So you have two men competing for the affections of the same woman. One of the examples that uh, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick puts forward is that actually the relationship between the two men in that love triangle is much more passionate, much more exciting, much more queer um, and much more interesting than the relationship either of the men have with the woman in question. So queer reading then, I think, is the closest uh, to the exercise that fan communities are undertaking when they produce fan fiction uh, which queers the narrative. And how does fan fiction or fan art queer the narrative? Well, it might feature, for example, uh, moments of same sex desire within that fan fiction and write them um, as part of the canon, or it might feature a character uh, that transgresses gender in some way um, or is explicitly transgender. So that sort of fan fiction, that sort of uh, LGBTQ plus fan fiction uh, does and undertakes an exercise of queering the canon, particularly where those fans are working with a canon where there is no meaningful existing uh, LGBTQ plus representation. Now, this also ties into queer coding because in undertaking their queer reading, fans might be picking up on coded signals that they are being given in the texts that they are dealing with. So as a community, we have been well used to having to look for these subtextual signs of LGBTQ plus identity. We have taken our icons from a place of queer coding and we have looked for queer possibility where it exists uh, beneath the uh, surface, beneath the veneer, the gloss uh, that presents the text to an uninitiated viewer as something quite different. Fan communities too are undertaking that exercise. They are looking for that subtextual moment of queer interest and they are translating that into the writing and the art that they produce. You then also have uh, the relationship between fan communities and queer baiting and it is often the transformative fan communities that are the most baited or the most aggressively baited by queer baiting ships. And so relationships that are often the focus of queer baiting, oftentimes you find that the producers will have some sort of relationship with the fans or the actors involved themselves will have some sort of relationship with the fans, uh, coming into it with the knowledge that this is something that fans really, really want to see happen and then sort of talk about it or dismiss it in ways uh, that can leave fans feeling fairly frustrated. Now, queer baiting is a very tricky uh, topic with a lot of different nuances and a lot of different sides to the argument. But I think what's really important is when you're talking about creator fan engagement is to understand the power imbalance that exists there. I think fans are empowered in fandom spaces to take the canon and to make it their own, to create something queer with it and to build their own community of readers and viewers of their art that will support their work and will support them in various different ways. However, when they are interacting with the creator, there is ultimately always going to be an imbalance of power. The pen is in the creator's hand and the words that the creators say are likely to have far more traction with the broader fandom uh, than the words of an individual fan or an individual cluster of fans. 
So I think that is also worth noting. And of course, uh, it has been uh, the case in where fans have shipped certain ships and wanted to see them together, uh, where their behaviour has been uh, very bad as well for various different reasons uh, in terms of the way that they have behaved with creators and those involved with the production online. Um, but that too is another conversation. So then we've seen the way that fan communities uh, relate the work that fan communities produce uh, relates to queer baiting. We've seen the way that fan communities uh, learn to pick up on coded signs and how that ability to pick up on coded queerness has a long history and legacy. And we've also seen how fans who produce uh, fan fiction that centres around same-sex desire and gender transgression and subverts those ideas of binary sexuality, a binary gender, or there being one particular way of being, um, is a form of queering the canon, a form of queering popular culture. Quite interesting, and fan fiction is new to you, then please do look into it. Have you ever thought about the possibility of two characters being together and yet that has never translated in the text that you've enjoyed? Have you ever imagined what a character's untold backstory might really be? Or have you ever thought about the possibility if a character that you love uh, was to be given more screen time? If that's you, then you might very likely find that other fans of the particular uh, thing that you're thinking about feel the same way. They might well have produced those stories for you, and then you can go forth and read all about them. Perhaps their vision doesn't quite meet up with yours, in which case I would encourage you to pick up your pen and write your own. What fan fiction does do is it creates a much larger body of LGBTQ plus uh, fiction uh, than would otherwise exist in the mainstream. And you actually find that starting to translate into the publishing industry more broadly, where writers of LGBTQIA young adult fiction, uh, a number of notable writers in that space, cut their teeth on fan fiction. That's where they started out in these fan communities that saw the potential potential uh, for queer desire between characters where there was previously uh, nothing stated within the source canon itself. So it really is a fantastically creative space and that is not to say that fan communities are not without their problems. That is not to say there are not issues that exist or there isn't a uh, replication of the structures and systems and inequities that perpetuate popular culture more broadly. This is simply a taster and a bit of an introduction to some of these, uh, some of the terminology that we might use when we think about things like queer coding, queer baiting and queer reading and the exercise that fan communities undertake when they work with canon in a way that queers uh, the source material. So there's lots of nuance to these discussions and there's a ton more that I could say, uh, but I don't have time at the moment to get into all of it. So I hope that what you've found this to be is a useful and interesting primer and that it might encourage you to go off and think about maybe watching Vito Russo's The Celluloid Closet or Disclosure, Trans Lives on Screen to find out more about the history of LGBTQ plus representation in media or it might encourage you to go and look into fan fiction and fan communities and to think about the work they do uh, with queering the canon. Alternatively, you might want to investigate more about queer baiting and to see if you recognise any of those signs or signals in any of the media that you're currently consuming and uh, considering how you feel about that and indeed if someone else has picked up on it too. So thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be part of the Leeds LGBT Literature Festival. I've really enjoyed uh, giving this talk and I hope that you've enjoyed listening to it. Thank you so much for listening uh, and I will see you hopefully next year.